Welcome to episode 135 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to Johnny Lloyd and Dan White from Tribes, who return with Rabbit Head, their first album in 10 years. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Mike Peters from Welsh rock legends The Alarm. So check it out. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating and leave a comment. Before we begin, here's what's been happening on Access Noise this week. In the review section, Sam Williams has been listening to the new self-titled album from Boy and Bear. It's the Australian indie rock band's fifth album, and their first to be released independently. Sam says the band's decision to record with a hybrid of analogue and digital techniques leads to a new, slightly more polished sound. But everything's kept down to earth by singer Dave Hosking's lyrics. Also on the side, we have tour news from the murder capital, new music from the Boo Radleys, and a feature exploring the link between poker and music videos. And the Foo Fighters continue the build-up to the release of their 11th album with the release of an epic 10-minute track with accompanying short film. The Teacher is the fourth single from But Here We Are. Watch it now at accessnoise.com. They might have taken the long way round, but Rabbithead feels like the album Tribes were always destined to make. They are a band revitalised. In this interview, Johnny Lloyd and Dan White talk about their hiatus, reforming the band, writing and recording Rabbithead and lots more. So sit back, relax and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Johnny and Dan from Tribes. So hi Johnny, hi Dan, welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Thanks for having us. So Tribes are back after a 10-year hiatus, and you'll release your third album, Rabbit Head, in August. It's a new era for the band. But before we get into that, let's go back to the start. Can you remember the first band or artist that made you pay attention to music? Yeah. Shall I go first? Here you go, and then I'll go. Um, I had, I had, a, I think it was a VHS, and I remember being like about eight, and my dad putting the song Remains the Same uh, Led Zeppelin film on. And there's a segment in that um, since I've been loving you. And I remember watching Jimmy Page just thinking he was kind of like this black magic kind of like wizard and becoming completely fascinated by him. That hasn't really left. So I'm still still trying to work that song out. But yeah, I think it was definitely that moment. That was the catalyst. And I was like, wow, like this is incredible. And that, that was kind of current music in my house. I was kind of insulated from anything modern. So that became like a fixation for me and started me off playing guitar, really. What about you, Dan? Um, I, my uncle, Barry, gave me, um, he was like a big rocker, and he gave me some vinyls um, when I was, I don't know, 12 or something. Um, but I didn't have a record player. But I, he, I had, um, he gave me ACDC Fly on the Wall album, and, and he gave me a White Snake album as well. But I didn't have anything to play them on, so I just used to look at them all the time. I thought they were really cool. And that was my first music. But then um, I remember when I got my first job, um, I went to, um, would it be HMV or Virgin at the time, record shop in Maidenhead where I grew up, and I bought my first CDs. And I just bought them based on what they looked like. I didn't know what they listened, what they sounded like. And that was Granddaddy Under the Western Freeway, the Benz, E17, and what's the story, Morning Glory? And that's everything. That's, that's what we sound like. <laughs> yeah, and they're my first four <laughs> CDs, and um, and they've really stuck. I mean, I had this little like Iowa CD, like stereo in my in my bedroom. I used to listen to them all the time, and they could have been anything, but they were they were the four, and um, perhaps I sort of they were very formative for me. Those four records. Especially you said, <laughs> and and you'd never heard them ever, and you no, just bought them. Just bought them. Yeah, yeah the Benz just sounded like, you know, I, I didn't realize it was like groundbreaking. That was just like one of the first records I ever heard. So that was just what records were like. Um, but yeah, they, 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 for me, those four were were big. <laughs> and these seventeen did have a couple of good songs. I have to say, oh, yeah. I had the hat and everything, man. <laughs> <laughs> So for anyone that doesn't know, how did you both meet and when did you form the band Tribes? 
Um, we met, I think, about 2006. Um, although I think it might... I remember meeting Dan. Dan was living down the road from me. I remember seeing him at house parties. But, like, the actual time when we met, it was just over several different things. And I was going to Paris to see a band called Good Shoes with Jimmy, who's the bass player. And the guy that we were going to Paris with dropped out that morning. And... Um, for some reason, I think he was a mate of, yeah, he's a big mate of yours. He invited me, yeah. And he was like, oh, you should take my place. So we just picked up Dan in his place and we went to Paris together, me, him and Jim, about four or five years before the band started. And we had a fucking mental weekend, like really <laughs> bad. <laughs> it's the night before I'd had a party at my house, being Camden at that time it was just like always a party. I'd had a house party and I forgot I was supposed to be going to Paris with these randos. And they turned up in the morning, picked me up. And I was still up, you know what I mean? I was still <laughs> at my party. I was like, all right. So I went and I remember going in Johnny's car and I was sick out the window on the way to Calais. Oh, yeah. this, this dad's car, he'd commandeered for the weekend. That's how we met. I think Jimmy was seeing this girl and we sort of been down slept on the floor in this, well, it's just a great weekend. But I'm I climbing up the cathedral. That was dangerous. Yeah, fuck. There was no chat at that point about us starting a band. We were in a different group, or Dan was about to be in that group. And then about 2009, we're in a pub in Hackney. And we were making kind of math rock. And we were like, let's do something else. You know, let's make a band that maybe represents a bit more of what we liked when we were kids, or just is a bit heavier and looser and a bit. A bit more fun, I think, was the was the key aim with Tribes. And it kind of happened. You know, I remember going into the pub after the first rehearsal and telling our mate Jamie Webb that, yeah, it was great. You know, I can't remember it. Funnily enough, me and Dan were listening back to the first demos the other day. They are it, shocking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, so it's beyond bad. It's it's like it's like lift music. But, but we, we, we were convinced at the time we were the best band in the world. And I think... Um, Regardless of the the factual integrity of said statement, we still believe it. <laughs> there was that you just saying you got that granddaddy CD is weird because it's like that was pretty much what we were going for. We yeah. were missing it, but we were going for that in early rehearsals. And then Dan switched from synth to guitar, and it all sort of clicked. So I was... joined Johnny's old band as an album designer. I designed the artwork for his old band, and then. They needed someone to play keyboards on tour, and I had no idea to play keyboards, but it sounded like fun. So I did that, and then off the back of that, we decided to start Tribes. And I introduced Miguel, who I grew up with, to these guys. And <laughs> I introduced Miguel to John. He went to go and, like, sniff out Miguel if he was, like, any good. And he went into the pub in Camden, the Holy Arms, where he was working. Miguel was stood on his hands on the bar, I think. Yeah, just, and then he tapped on the... <laughs> The table is like an audition. It was like, yeah, you got the job. Couldn't yeah, be anybody else. It's just like, but it took a while, you know. It wasn't like instantaneous. We we were really, it was pretty like two and a half years before we got signed, I think. And it was like we were just on the road with no plan, just touring a lot until the Mystery Jets took us out, and then it really clicked. Like, or no I, fixed abode. Yeah, it was just it was a pretty miserable time, but it was also like we had we used to it was amazing. We used to give these demos out with our with Island Records logo on, which I think talk about like <laughs> manifesting it, you know. So it's like we're going to sign to Island, whatever the fuck it takes. We're gonna we're gonna do it. And it like, <laughs> even though we kept getting rejected, and then eventually we got these offers in. And I think in that week it was like Atlantic, Mercury, and Island, and it all happened in like a week. And we're like, God, it's actually going, but. But there was no, there was, there was just blind faith, like we were saying, like it's just totally, we've always just absolutely believed it. And I think that's carried us through all the highs and lows of it, really. Back in the era of like aspiring to major label stuff as well, I think it's very yeah. these days. Yeah, I mean, it's, and we weren't on the internet, you know, it's a totally different time, really. We, we completely shunned all that stuff. We just had CDs and just played a lot of gigs. Well, you eventually released your debut album, Baby, which was very well received. So what do you think of when, when you cast your mind back to that period of craziness? Uh, I just remember, like, there being, like, no rules to anything. Like, that period in Camden was brilliant. I feel very blessed to have, like, been part of it. It was like everyone was in a band. Everyone worked in it, in the pubs. Every pub 
had gigs on and you'd go out on Friday with a fiver and come home on Tuesday. Or at the time, Miguel and I didn't have any homes. We lived on Johnny's sofa for that whole two years of the first bit of the band. It was just glorious. Like, it didn't, like everything just felt possible, but also, like, it was, we were very much in the present, you know? Yeah. And being in tribes at that point was just, our entire universe was Camden, and that was like, enough. Uh, and it was great. But we obviously aspired to do Island Records and go to LA and stuff, but it was just a really incredible, like, centralised moment of culture. It was really, and we felt like we were at the centre of it. It was great. It was amazing times. And there was, there was moments when it was like we started travelling abroad, which was, like, really... I remember that being a real shock to me. <laughs> so I was just thinking, like, oh, my God, this is going to be, like, our ticket to go places. And we first, our first time we landed in Japan and we started going to America, and it was just like, wow, like, this is absolutely... You know, it's just living the best possible existence, and and surrounded by all our friends who were so sort of supportive to it as well. So it was a great, it was an epic time in Camden, and probably never to be repeated now with the way it is today. You know, I do feel like a shame. Something just touched on that. It's like um, not to get too deep into you know wider stuff, but I think it's a shame. Like you get back to Camden now and other places, not not just not to be nostalgic too much, but it feels like the way that London is so expensive now, those sort of centralised pockets of music scenes seem more difficult to, to like to happen, you know? So everyone's just seen more, like they've pushed further and further apart from each other. But I always think that's a bit of a tragedy. Um, yeah, and I do, think, you think, do, you, do you think it could be there's less venues? I mean, it's something we've been talking a lot about recently about, uh, we rehearse in Brick, even though I live in Dorset, we can't. We rehearse in Brixton, a place called Brixton Hill Studios. That's been threatened with uh, closure. Our old rehearsal room in Camden Scar got shot down to be um, turned into flats. So it's like rehearsal rooms, recording studios, venues. Like, like, what is this country without its music scene? You know, it's such a huge part of it. I think it's it's just tragedy that these places aren't protected. It's it's sort of like income. rent cap or some sort of subsidy on it, you know. It's just, it's just fucking mad. And they've totally gone. Like Camden's a different place, but I also think like the age of social media. It's like we weren't comparing ourselves every five minutes to other people. We were just doing what we wanted, what we felt like was a good thing, you know. And we were allowed to evolve in venues unseen, you know, without sort of people videoing it or whatever. So I think now it's like you've got nowhere to play, but you've got this huge social media presence when you kind of have to come out the gates fully finished and polished, you know, when you just, you kind of, we're like the last generation to not have to do that. Um, we had, I think we had a Facebook, but it wasn't really managed, you know. So I think it's a really strange time, particularly for rock music. And living, still living in Camden, it's it's just vanished. It's just completely, you know, the high, it's more like Kensington, this place now. And and also labels look at how many how much of a following you have first before you even listen to the music. Yeah, yeah that was weird. It was like X <laughs> there was a venue XOYO, was it? And we were played to like this has always been a shock because I think it's four hundred people there that night. We hadn't put anything out. That was the day that Island saw us. But it just happened because we played a lot and we'd had we've been really lucky with local promoter Dave Danger who'd really sort of put some work in like promoting the band and I just don't know how you get that groundswell now without without the use of social media. It's interesting. I was speaking when speaking to a, a young artist near me recently about it, and he was asking about how to sort of break through it and whether he should like buy onto a tour and stuff. And I mean, I don't know if this advice is perhaps nostalgic for our our era before, but I was like, you've got you've got to go out and play to no one and earn your stripes and just do and make fans that way i think just relying on um on being discovered digitally doesn't seem like you're building very strong foundations but eh, i'm no expert i think meeting people after the shows as well like we personally knew a lot of our early fans you know because we it's just... something we've always proud proud uh, pride ourselves on is like being in the real world yeah, we met we met everybody, knew them by name, and you know it's kind of like how it grew. 
Explain ban onto a tour for anyone that doesn't know. Well, I suppose it's something that happens. Um, is it clandestine, perhaps? But it's definitely a shadowy thing where you could essentially pay the main artist to be the support act on that tour. It's not something we've ever done, um, but I'm sure it happens more often than, than you'd think. I think it's big in, America, in the States as well. Essentially, you're using, you know, you're buying the publicity you get from supporting a bigger act, but it feels a bit cloak and daggers to me. Yeah. After touring your, your second album, Waste to Scream, in 2013, you all went your separate ways. So what happened? Well, the band disbanded for several reasons, but mainly I was just in a really sort of dead end of a place, stressed and just sort of really burnt out. Um, and we didn't see each other for many a year, really, up until probably, I mean, we kind of bumped into each other, but not, I don't think we were all together till 2019. We went to see Jimmy play with Dinosaur Pilot. Um, and it, the 10 year anniversary was coming up with Baby. And I reached out to Dan and was like, you know, maybe we could do something. And we started hanging out and Dan moved down to Dorset um, in a cottage just up the road from me. And we'd, um, and it was just a great thing to have us all back together. And we were very excited by it. And we were kind of like, um, we're feeling a bit more whole, I think. And we put this show on sale for Choose Love, which is a charity that we know quite well. And it sold out really fast. And then they put another show on and it sold out again. And we were like, you know, it's amazing that people still have this feeling for our band and maybe we could like, you know, upgrade the venue again and then maybe do something else. You know, and I think songs and songs, the live performance for us, but also the songwriting um, has been equally as exciting. Uh, so it was like, I remember standing on a beach uh, with Mig um, having a barbecue <laughs> and Dan sent me this voice note of Hard Pill and it was just killer, you know, and it was just like, wow, that's a new tribe song. That's that's really exciting to like okay. new uh you know, a new song, like a new beginning of something. And we just launched into it like full throttle, really. I think that's been a big important thing um about coming back to it again is like like John says, like towards the end of Wish to Scream and us splitting up, Johnny was under all the pressure to co- carry the band, you know, he's writing all the songs and doing all the interviews and you felt really burnt out by it, bless him. I totally understand that. And one of the things we all agreed this time coming back is that that wouldn't be the case. And we'd collectively all support each other through it because, you know, it's, it's a hard, it's a it's a long old graph being in the band. It's not easy. You know, it's a full-time thing. Psychologically, you know, you always have to be on, like always writing and stuff. So I think that's something we've learned coming back is, you know, we've all, grown up a bit and we've had a lot of life experiences and realized how important the band was for us like personally and it was something to be like cherished and, and nourished and as opposed to perhaps at that point we kind of taken it for granted a little bit and become a little complacent and perhaps even a little entitled um there's a lot of ego perhaps floating about and i think this time we've really addressed that it doesn't seem that ego or anything like that is at all the driver behind it. We're really more focused on the thrill of being back together and working together and writing together and just being each other's company. And it just feels like it comes from a very different place this time and it feels lighter and more manoeuvrable and definitely more creative. And, um, yeah, it's just good times to be in tribes, I think. What was it like when you first got together in a studio or on a stage? You know, was it the same as before or did it feel different? Yeah, it was in my front room, I think, wasn't it? We had a little rehearsal. The first time we played, yeah. It it, it felt the same. Like, the, the band is always... Jimmy and Mig are this incredible rhythm section. As soon as it comes in, it can't be anything else but tribes. They they kind of define the sound, and me and Dan, like, float around on top. But it was like... A, it was a great first rehearsal and it just sort of clicked it took us a while to get the old songs back in the swing and sort of but by that point we were already thinking about new music you know so we kind of we kind of reformed in the studio and then sort of took it to the stage you know by the time we played the forum we'd been recording for almost nine months so it was like it was further along than people saw I think it's like yeah we we are sort of ready to make this new album we've got some great songs and 
uh, we've been working creatively together and that just went like you know like house on fire just sort of really gelled really quickly and everyone's taking more of a role individually and as a unit we have a better structure as to who does what you know we're more defined in our roles i think and uh it was just song after song you know it's hard picking what was going to go on the record it was kind of it was a collaboration between me and dan at the same time it was competitive and then mickey brought in some you know stuff and jimmy brought in some tunes and it was just like we'd egg each other on so we had like 40 songs you know um so it was a great thing is like i was living down the road so he'd like go around and down i got a new one no i fuck you i've got one too this is your mind better and they'd be like that's how these songs pile up you know and uh and also like oh. push each other to be the best that we could be and just have that patience to finish stuff and make sure it's the best it can be and not just move on you know i'm i'm really bad with that um dan's much better dan has obviously been has become a producer in the interim meaning that we can we can work as a unit without an, any outside influence which is really interesting in its own way gives you more time um you're not under the clock on the studio but also means we can try stuff sort of textually and sonically that we never have before what for when we had that first rehearsal in journeys well before that what's the geography of the reunions interesting that we came down to Dorset. Johnny had a place down here and I moved my studio down here. So, and disclaimer, not in any way like comparing ourselves to the Beatles, but when they had that moment in Hamburg kind of off the, you know, off the radar, we kind of had this wonderful little version of that down in Dorset where we were just left on it, just me and John, just like there's no, there's two houses in the middle of nowhere. And we were just backwards and forwards every day, just writing songs and sharing. And I had the studio there. So we had this ability to just really focus in without any other distraction, apart from the pub down the road. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that was wonderful. But one thing that really jumped out for me anyway, in that first rehearsal in his front room, so when we all started playing, it was like, oh, shit. And kind of had to stop, almost stop. But it was like, it was too hot. There was like this, this, uh, the, the thing that is created when we play together, and I'm sure every other band has this, you know, had Zeppelin describe it. Again, not compare ourselves to Zeppelin, but there's like an, an excess. There's something other that's, something other that's created that's wonderful. That is, that is what the band is. It's not necessarily the, the four of us. It's the thing that happens like the extra bit and i think the making of the record has been try has been an exercise in trying to figure out what that is and capture that and really like mine into the core of it rather than working with another producer or bringing in any other ideas or influence it was very much like what actually is this thing that we missed so much and that we feel is important to 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 celebrate again so the result of that is your third album Rabbit Head, which yeah. comes out comes out in August. And I have to say, it's amazing to hear a record with brilliant, catchy rock guitar anthems and, and great songwriting. You know, it's quite refreshing these days, you know. So let's let's talk about some of the tracks. Um, the first track so far, as you mentioned, was Hard Pill. What a Ooh. tune. When I first heard that, I thought, okay, tribes are back, the mean business. What can you tell me about that song? Well, that that it came from uh, an initial idea of mine. John and I had started talking about doing this sh- reunion gig. And then I was had my studio in Hackney at the time. I remember sort of putting the phone down to John, not in an aggressive way, <laughs> just literally off the phone. <laughs> and I was in the studio at the time, and I was waiting for an artist to turn up, uh, and I had a guitar set up. I just started playing that, and that riff came out. And then, and then the first lyric is, can you look me in the eye? And that kind of seemed to like such scratch at this idea of like us falling out and then trying to understand the us falling out and then the song is about coming back together um but also not it's not specifically about us you know but it's it's one of those nice songs that's kind of light on its feet that can be can be about the idea of just coming back together uh in a in a wider sense but then it also just the energy of it felt very much like us. Um, uh, like it's got roots in Baby in the, our first album for sure. But also I think it's it's kind of looking forward to what we could do in the future. 
feels like a really good bridge between the old era and the new one. And it ultimately became the catalyst for everything else. Like John said, I sent him like a really rough demo of it on my phone. And that was, that was like the moment like, okay, right. We're obviously going to make a record now. We better, we better do this. Exciting. It's hard to pick one favorite track from the album. So I've, I've picked a few to talk about. Um, 10 ways to improve your new life. I, I love the breakdown. And then it goes into a huge sound along re- refrain. Like John was saying, like he was living up the road and we'd go backwards and forwards with with songs and I'd and I had like the front half of the song, the how do you like the view? And it was kind of slower and strummy. I took it up to John and then we thought we just thought we went out with our guitars and played through it. We decided to do it and we went about studio and we and then we thrashed it out on like louder guitars and then I remember we sort of got to the end of what I'd written and I had the idea for this other sort of slower chord thing. And then John came up with the idea of singing the, the, the big outro vocal over it. And it just suddenly felt like, ah, fuck. It just suddenly the first half is like a sort of runaway train. And then it just, it's almost if it looked in like, you know, back to the future, it flies off the cliff. It just sort of like opens up (laughs) into this thing. That felt really cool. It was just a really, again, it was just like, oh, God, we, because we were making a record, we weren't focusing on singles or individual tracks. It was like, we felt like we could do anything and we could really like push songs to their limit or like in terms of songwriting craft. And we could break them and we could actually abuse them a little bit because we knew we could do other things for on the record and balance it all out. Um, it's kind of a lot of information there, but it's great hearing the piano as well. I remember when you're like, let's just try this on piano and sort of put that down, and it was like, fuck, that's like kind of new for us, you know? Yeah, and it's a bit glam, that isn't it? It was like an Elton John or Queen kind of thing. We're like, it just works so well, I think. The, the lyrics on that one as well, are, are, uh, you know, it's kind of touches on this idea of, uh, of like an addiction to wellness culture and, and, yeah, the, the the title of it for me has always been the idea of one of those sort of articles of like, you see, like, you know, literally, here's how you can be a better version of yourself, which I'm always quite sort of sceptical of. And then the kind of cacophony of news and information and all this kind of stuff that all kind of just like melts into one big messy noise. Um, that's kind of the energy of that song, I suppose. And by the time this podcast goes out, you'll have released the next track from the album, Madison, with the, the punky garage track. I really enjoy that. Yeah, um, that was the last one to be written, I think. I think I was like this having, I, have, I still am, but it's having like a bit of a punk moment. Like I'm really late to like the Germs and Black Flag um, and Circle Jerk and all this sort of stuff. I actually read Flea's book and sort of got turned on to it by then. And was just like, oh God, yeah, I really want to do something with some pace. Um, and sort of wrote it. It's actually written on the same day as Tough Guy, and then was like, kind of, kind of excited by it, by it. But sort of got Dan over to play it to him, and he seemed quite excited by it. But it felt like very early tribes to me. It felt kind of like this is going to be really kind of, kind of sort of garage punk. You know, we could sort of put this down in a couple of takes, find some kind of element to it that's like raw. But it was also like a kind of a joke as well because it's about our band and it's like about how, <laughs> how rough it is on the road essentially, which sort of that's made... what I love about it though because like we've like we've hard pill romanticizes this whole like idea of us coming back together and being in the band and then <laughs> medicine's like well you're back in the band now <laughs> and you're on the M1 in a travel lodge. <laughs> And it's shit, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it's kind of glorious, you know. It's the yeah, glory yeah. of that kind of like just like grim reality of touring, uh, but we love it. You know? It's like you said at the beginning, you know, it's like kind of that idea that the seventies is over and no one gets paid. You know? yeah, that was the big li- when I heard that lyric, I was like, "That's fucking great." <laughs> Yeah, other favourites, you know, I love Celebrate, Boy, Fade the Credits. Um, and the final track on, on the album, Message from the Sponsor, it's it's just a beautiful way to end the album. Yeah, um, that was, it's always, it's always like, it's the one of the things I really love about this 
band is there's like we allow like a different there's different shades you know i kind of was like god is that going to be too like soft or sensitive for tries but really we kind of built it on like halfway home and you know coming of age and stuff so it's great to get an acoustic one on the record um and he mentioned boy there which is one of my faves which was really late and i think we would actually finish the album i can't remember but dan played it to me with his partner one night and i was like it's gotta it's gotta go on that i wasn't sure if it like we, it's a recurring conversation where like i'd write something and i'd be oh did johnny's like oh i've got this thing like i don't know if it's a tribe song and johnny but it's a fucking tribe song you've got to get on there. <laughs> But so I kind of discounted Boy as perhaps like a different kind of, I don't know. It was just I didn't really know what to do with it. And John came around to mine and we'd had a lot. Of, <laughs> we'd had a few aperitivos and it was um, pretty late at night. And one, so I know one thing Johnny and I like to do when we've had a couple of drinks is deep dive into all the demos <laughs> it, it drives our partners mad we just say, yeah. listening to the demos and let's go oh, this is a great song man. we're just gonna go upstairs and be back in an hour <laughs> so we were doing that and then and then my demo of boy started playing and um yeah and john was like oh we got we got to go on the record so it went on so it does feel like a bit of a, a sharp turn but within the context of everything else i think it triangulates the record in a quite a nice way. It sort of leans towards stuff we might be able to do further down the line. I'm a big Damon Albarn fan, you know, and I've always admired his ability to like to like, you know, go on this sort of musical safari around the world. And yeah, yeah, I mean that's a big part of my own sort of creative inquiry is is that sort of side of songwriting as well. I've always wanted to do something that, you know, I love Back to Jury. I like and the streets records were huge for me growing up and I always wondered what if my voice could do something like that so it was an interesting thing to, to try really I think and we've gone in all those directions are we any any way we thought oh right let's just put our toe in there we've we've done it so it's like it's exciting that we've um we've actually had the time and space to be able to do that you know those tracks you mentioned there they're all quite different like fade to credits message and boy but we've had the time to do we'll celebrate that and celebrate and actually be like come on let's give this like a go you know and it's hard to do that if you've just got one month to make an album like we did with baby and wish to scream when the tracks of you know maybe two a day go down you know so it's hard it's it's been great just to have the time and space to like experiment a bit but that that's what i love about the album it's so diverse musically so you just don't know what's coming next and it makes it very enjoyable do you think there's too many tracks on the record? I no, mean... definitely, no, definitely not. Oh, cool. <laughs> Ism, Ism, it's another, it's a good rocker. I love the guitars in it. Yeah, Ism, Ism was a really fun one. Like John and I had these moments of like frenzy. We'd come round to mine and where the studio is. And we just like, sometimes it would just, it, if it was going well, Johnny would always scream out, good things are happening. And that was <laughs> that, that was one of the tracks because because we'd had we had like Hard Pill and Celebrate and these other songs that you know they 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 you know they're kind of serious rock songs you know and because we had them that afforded us the opportunity to to kind of throw caution to the wall a bit and and really just sort of stream of conscious whatever ideas come out let's go with it and that was what ism really is you know just like let's just allow something to just come straight out onto the page and that was that so what's the meaning behind the the title rabbit head where did that come from okay so it's hard it's a hard one we're gonna go for it so <laughs> strange <laughs> strange in jokes form when you're with people for a thousand hours a week or whatever so i just use <laughs> buzzwords essentially to express myself because I have an inability to do that with normal language. But I was just saying to the engineer a lot, like there's a film called Donnie Dark, I'm sure you know it, and there's a specific type of blue that forms the tunnel that goes to his head, then meets the rabbit's head. <laughs> and that blue is like, I often talk about music in colour, that blue is a specific type of 
sound or chords or um pitch that i would describe most of rem's catalog in i think i was about to say rem we're making tough guy and it was like ah tom like just give it some more blue give it some more of that sort of like crystal blue you know that rabbit head shit from uh from the film and then it just the explanation went and he just like turn the rabbit head up turn it up turn it up and then eventually it was just rabbit heads you know that was like this song's fucking rabbit head man and it would be that was it i wish but it, it also had has the fun. other side of like because we did it all in dorset in the woods you know like in the middle of nowhere like for me rabbit head feel is dorset it's like this idea of like you know like like dead rabbits in the woods and the flies and the cow the pagan thing yeah pagan all that stuff like i feel it, that's why it works so well because it captured both of those sort of sides of the record i think a lot of that you know we're city boys who found ourselves in the middle of dorset on an army range like it was, it was in a, a cottage right? it's, it's bonkers really thinking we ever landed there but yeah. it really it really shaped the whole thing and yeah, it has got that. Uh, you know, that, that's that's what we should say in interviews moving forward. I think well, <laughs> just the countryside element of it. But no, but you're right. It, it is it is both of those because I because to- like I totally get. I can hear the the blue rabbit headness of that side of it, but I also hear the the kind of the mud and the flies and the spiders of it all as well. Yeah, I think there's like. That's why it seemed to capture it all. I know it was perfectly captured by Fee on the uh, Dan's partner, Fee Greening, on the um, album artwork. I don't know if you've seen that, but yeah, yeah, that That'd was just good. like all the sort of little nuances of that experience is sort of like put into that illustration, which is just brilliant. So you've you've already played a homecoming show at Dublin Castle and a, su- a support slot with DMA. So how did the, those shows go, and how did it feel to be back on a stage in front of your own audience? Well, we had a big, forum was the big one. Yeah, we had a big gig at the forum in 2021 at the end of that year, which was kind of a big comeback show. And then we played a splattering of festivals last year. Um, but this this year has been great. Like Dublin Castle was a little kind of secret thing. We played a, a splattering is a horrible word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we played a few festivals. Like, but yeah, DMAs was cool. Like it was the first time we've done a couple of those venues, like Wembley. It's the first time we played Wembley Arena, which was amazing. And I don't think their crowd are that dissimilar. So we had, we had a really good time. And it's just been great playing together again. And it's also like been a challenge getting the new songs in. Um, but the set just feels really strong now. You know, it's like, it's exciting to be able to drop some of the, you know, the songs we weren't that keen on and sort of replace them with these like big new tracks. It's just been great. Uh, yeah, just absolutely thrilled for the future of it. And you'll be playing the, the Roundhouse on the 30th of September. So how much are you looking forward to that? Yeah, it's, it's going to be great. Um, we did it on the Wish the Screen run, but I think we got sort of... It's just, yeah, just the set list. It's just, just cannot wait. You know, it's like, it's just great to get all the tribes lot in the same room as well. <laughs> it's, it's, like <laughs> great. it's like a football match at the Forum. Um, and also just to, hopefully by then, people would have digested it a bit. You know, it would have been out like four or five weeks. Um, it was amazing in Dublin Castle, even on such a small scale, hear, hearing people sing Hard Pill. It's always like just you've had something in your head for so long and then you see somebody sing it back to you. It's a strange thing. It's like, oh, that's not your song anymore, you know. I so, can't wait to hear some of it. I really hope, like, you know, because it's, it's an unknown, isn't it, when you when you make a record. It's, you have no idea if it's going to connect with people. Because, oh, like, we made the record for ourselves, really, you know, we, to satisfy um a longing to be together and also creative like um creatively we needed to make the record uh, and now it's like it's kind of it's over and on to everyone else and but yeah it, the, the idea of seeing those songs connect with people is a is a wonderful thing i really hope happens um just to see people singing back would feel like a real achievement in in itself you know you know really really hope that happens it'll be really cool (laughs) 
I've no doubt because the songs in the, the album, the new album, you know, they're they're very catchy, you know, and and they're anthemic, as I said at the start, you know. So it'll be great in a live setting, absolutely. I think a problem that we face with it is just like everyone who's heard the record has has loved it, and every reaction on the Tinter web has been we've had everything's been really positive, but it's you know it's really difficult to cut through. The, the just the vast amount of music out there and, and all the noise and just get the record heard. And, you know, we're not, we're not on a big shiny major label. We don't have like loads of budget. And so now the creative task is how do we get people to hear the record? You know, that that's like the new um, the challenge ahead. Now it's like, we believe in the record, but we need to get it in, in, in into people's ears, you know, and that's a, it's a difficult thing to do these days so that's the new challenge ahead if people want to understand your music what are the five songs they should listen to fuck from the record <laughs> from all the from, 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 yeah oh mine would be oh, i don't know i mean I, <laughs> that's a great I, question great question yeah. <laughs> um, i mean we were children obviously <laughs> is, yeah that, that is like that's your book stream song on spotify yeah, yeah, and that 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 was what opened the door out of the back room of a Camden pub onto the rest of the world. You know, that's the thing that got it going. Uh, so you can go next, John. The second one. That, that's that's only one. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, <laughs> um, okay, let's let's do let's do one each then. Um, my the second one I pick would be Halfway Home from Baby just because it shows for the first time that sort of lighter side of the band and then it sort of crescendos into that outro which i think is kind of a trick we use um but also is just my favorite one of my favorite tracks okay number three yeah <laughs> easy easy hard pill because it's it's the bridge between the old era the new era and that's where we are now <laughs> <laughs> okay i uh um i'll go with tough guy off the new record just because for me that's one of my favorite sort of exposed acoustic moments and i think that's a big part of the group as well sometimes okay five <laughs> <laughs> i i'd have to say boy because i think it's that is a, a sign of us having no fear and, and being able uh, we don't it shows that we're not confined by any sense of musical identity. And I think we can really, we can surprise ourselves creatively if we're brave. And that shows a good, shows good things to come creatively for me. I think that it's like, we, we're actually capable of much more than perhaps we ever realised creatively. And it, we're, we can have a bigger artistic universe and more varied in our songwriting. So yeah, I'll say that. I think that's a good five. But that's what leads on to, you know, my next question. You know, where do you see the band heading in the next few years? What what ambitions do you have? I think the ambition is really just to keep creating good music. I, I think it's hard to sort of say we want to play here, we want to play there, and and you know, put a sort of number on it in terms of like capacities and shit. It's just like we want to make good records and we'll mm. try and continue to do that in our in the best way that we can. Um, the live stuff and the sort of uh, commercial elements you can't really control. So I think it's just creatively it's moving forward um, as, uh, and doing it to the best of our abilities by keeping the albums as regular as we can. I think the goal for any artist today has got to be sustainability, you know, that we can keep this thing going for as long as possible. Um, we know between Johnny and I that there's no lack of ideas for songs and, and the music I feel like is just going to keep coming. Um, we've got the studio at my house, so there's nothing to stop us keep going. So just want to keep making records and keep challenging ourselves and hopefully um, connect with more people and continue to do it for the right reasons without ego and um, just, yeah, just keep going, really. <laughs> do you plan to play live shows beyond the UK? Yeah, we've yeah, got we'll, shows in yeah. Italy coming up in September. Um, we seem to have connected quite well in Italy, which is lovely because Italy's great. Um, but I, I, we'd like 
we love taking the band out of the UK. Um, uh, and I personally really enjoy the kind of, uh, f- not friction, but I like the idea of our kind of stupid, <laughs> scruffy little band uh, being in uh, exotic places. Not that palm trees exotic, but anything out of Camden's exotic, you know, like <laughs> just the <laughs> idea of just us being places where we don't, <laughs> It doesn't really make sense for us to be. I, I love that. I love the idea of that. I you know, love to, I don't know, just want to take it all around the world. And... It'd be great to get back to Japan, wouldn't it, and, like, do some of those places and see see where it lands. Again, it's just, it's hard to know where it connects. You know, you just don't know until the record's out. All we know, all we have in our control is making the records. Um, we've got a great team management, great agent, and, you know, we trust them to do they're best with it. So as long as we just focus on what we're good at, then it will do what it's supposed to do. You know, it'll go as far as it as it can. And we can just wish it well on its on its journey. Just a few more questions, guys. I like to ask my guests the following questions: If you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career, what would it be? I think walking on stage for the first time in Japan was a highlight for me. That was just a totally, totally different world. We hadn't, we just put, uh, which is uh, the um, We Were Children EP out. So we hadn't even released Baby yet. And it just felt so massive to be there and be doing that. But also just like the difference in culture and what we were seeing day to day was just extraordinary. You know, we've never, ever been that far away. So that for me it was something that I still remember being backstage. I still remember like everything about it, like the walk to stage and you know, and just how unbelievably hot it was. I remember that. But yeah, it was a great, it was a great like 48 hours. Um so yeah, that'd be it. For me, it would be making baby in the studio with Mike Crossy. Um I wish I could go back to that now, like with the same and, and firstly pay more attention to what Mike was doing and to be able to go back with the understanding I have now about making records on a technical level, but also in on like a uh, on a social level, but all those sort of things that are important in making records like there was such a formative experience, but I, I wish I could go back and see it through the eyes I have now you know, and really try and absorb more of it because it was just wonderful. For us music fans, music is the soundtrack to our memories. What song or album, when you listen to it, brings back the best memories for you? I think Loaded by the Velvet Underground reminds me of really happy times in my childhood. Sweet Jane is always something I put on. It reminds me of being quite young and being in the kitchen with my folks and sort of like my early sort of friendships I had. And this sort of formed a total um template for the music i like and also like the way um i play as well like it's all kind of from that from that album anything off definitely maybe really or or i do anything on the first two oasis albums um maybe live forever or rock and roll so i just it, for me that's like reminds me of like do my a levels at school i had this little black beaten up mini i used to drive around in and i just have that i the memory of like having that blaring with the windows open like just leaving school and just thinking that everything is possible you know what i mean like that feeling i don't i think that was a really special feeling that um could only be created by oasis on those records in, in at that time it's hard to believe that album is 30 years old next year. I know. <laughs> I believe that. I can't believe I'm now. You know? Crazy, isn't it? What song or album is your guilty pleasure? Oh, I mean, no one's guilty pleasures are as guilty as his. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, what was that? We had this track. Be honest. Come on. We had this song the other day. It was at Lady in Red, and I called you. I was like, I think every single songwriting trick I've ever used is in this song. It was we that, with, yeah, yeah, Lady yeah. in Red. I can't remember who it's by, but that no, was, we were, we were Christopher. Yeah, we were like, I was like, that is, oh, like, is this a tribe song? No, I feel like I wrote that song. <laughs> what ideas are in it? So yeah, it would be it would be Lady in Red. Oh man, give me pleasure. 
Um, oh, you know, I've got some good ones as well. Phoebe Flynn, she'd be able to tell me she was always put up on them. I don't know if it's a guilty pleasure, but I always think it's a great song. It's Waterfalls by TLC. What a great song. Classic. It's a classic track. Yeah. Great tune. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll go for that. I think it's just a, ba- it's a great song. Hope it is. Uh, that, that's me finished, guys. Is there anything you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Anything else coming up in the immediate future? Just Round how tickets are on well. sale. Roundhouse. Round, yeah, Roundhouse tickets on sale, September the 30th. Um, yeah, that'd be it. Good. Well, listen, guys, the album is absolutely fantastic. I wish you all the best with it. Thanks and so hopefully, much. Hopefully you'll come to Belfast or uh, Dublin sometime. Yeah, that's the plan. Just in the uh, future. S- send, send out record out to all your mates, and then we'll be over. No, absolutely. I will be definitely champion. I've, I've been telling <laughs> a lot of people about it. I've told them. Well, the tribes are back. Check yeah, it right. out. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. It's been great talking to you. Thanks, Paul. See you. See you in a bit, mate. Thanks,